So good afternoon. It's my pleasure to be interviewing you today. And uh, today we've come together to talk about your approach to learning about aging and how teenagers could find this area of longevity interesting. So would you please start by telling us a little bit about yourself, your work and your research? Right, so uh, my name is Dario Riccardo Valenzano. Uh, I am a, an Italian scientist uh, and uh, I currently work uh, at the Max Planck Institute for Biology of Aging in Cologne, Germany. Uh, and my, um, my research career has started in Italy um, uh, during my, uh, my studies in the, at the University of Pisa and the Scuola Normale Superiore, where I studied neuroscience. Uh, and I, since already my grad school, I got very much interested in the field of biology of aging from the standpoint of evolutionary biology. Initially, biology of aging to me uh, sounded like an evolutionary paradox. I couldn't quite make sense of how organisms would uh, be selected to, to live short or longer and how, to what extent evolution was shaping uh, lives and aging across species in nature and this is the main driver has been for me to, to study to, to get into the field of biology of aging. Uh, from my PhD I followed up my studies uh, moving from Italy to the United States uh, where I moved for my postdoc at Stanford University where I, I went into genetics and genomics uh, and uh, after uh, a few years at Stanford University I moved back to Europe and I started my lab in 2013 uh, in Cologne, Germany, at the Max Planck Institute of Biology of Aging, where I am right now. And, uh, and here in Cologne, I have continued my study on biology of aging, uh, developing uh, several of the research lines that I, I wish I could develop during my, my PhD and my postdoc. So here I had the opportunity to uh, assign this project to my collaborators and students and together with them uh, ask uh, relevant questions um, and uh, see those projects unfold in their own ends and uh, uh, under their own guidance. So um, the research lines that I studied, my, my own research direction is that of uh, evolutionary biology of aging. So I study how species indeed evolved to be long-lived or short-lived. Uh, we try to answer questions of like, how come there are organisms like, you know, Greenland shark that live for, you know, 500 years, or how come there are organisms that live just a few weeks? And what are the genes, what are the selective pressures that shape lifespan and aging strategies across different species? Um, what are the genes that are responsible for living long or living short in the natural world? And uh, uh, additionally to this type of questions, we also ask questions of uh, within species, how can we modulate the aging process and how can we um, in particular extend lifespan and uh, slow down, reprogram the aging process. And in this respect, we very much are interested in um, uh, studying how the microbiome, so this uh, very, um, uh, you know, diverse community of uh, microorganisms that live in close association with us, participate in the process of homeostasis or maintaining health, and how much they can be harnessed to modulate the aging process in organisms. Thank you for sharing this, Dr. Valenciano. And what would you say inspired you to take this approach to longevity? And how did you find interest in longevity in the first place? Right, so initially uh, studying longevity wasn't necessarily on my radar and um, uh, I was more into uh, trying to understand how behavior uh, works, uh, animal behavior in particular. But then um, deeping, you know, deepening my studies in evolutionary biology, uh, I really got into the concept of fitness, right? So of uh, reproductive success. And one of the things that really struck me about the concept of the operational concept of fitness is that in order for you to be successful in reproducing and spreading your, your genes in the next generation, you have to live long enough for reproduction, for reproduction to happen. And the more you can reproduce throughout a longer time, the more successful you will be over, over other individuals, over other strategies, over other you know, alleles, even if you want. 
in that respect, I, I started thinking that, uh, you know, I, I started, you know, reading around about how evolutionary biology uh, understands uh, the fact that despite what I just said, several organisms seem to fail to maintain themselves for long enough time to outcompete others and keep on reproducing. And so it seemed like there was a limit to how long organisms could successfully spread uh, their genes to the next generation. And so I was trying to understand what this limit was and all these puzzles, all these, you know, um, I, I like to solve puzzles. I like to, you know, have this kind of like problem solving attitude. Um, and uh, so, you know, from a very personal standpoint, I really got intrigued by this seeming um, evolutionary puzzle that uh, evolutionary biology uh, uh, of aging poses. And, uh, um, and that's how I got hooked into biology of aging, the different theories uh, that I studied diligently and didn't quite uh, agree with necessarily. And uh, that's exactly what you need, right? So when you don't quite, you know, you understand something, but you don't quite agree with it, that you have probably like a margin to, to and a space to, to formulate your own personal hypothesis and, and then test it and see whether you're missing some, some, uh, some fundamental uh, basic concept or whether indeed there is like some uh, um, inconsistency in the theory. So this kind of like, open questions type of uh, issue that really led me into exploring different aspects of biology of aging, which are still the ones that I'm currently pursuing in my lab and, uh, uh, and several of my um, postdocs or PhD students or master's students are currently working on every day. And what were the greatest hardships you met and how did you overcome them? Well, the greatest hardships, um, well, sometimes, you know, it's methodological, right? So sometimes, you wish you had perfect model organism, or you wish you had um, a faster computer to simulate uh, all your models in a short time, or um, you wish you had the skills to understand some uh, um, some um, obscure biochemistry or molecular biology. So um, I think that um, um, as as a scientist, you're Continuously, you know, the, you're surrounded by a constellation of, uh, of obstacles in a way, of, uh, and you have to win your way through this, you know, thick bush in a way. Um, I guess I started off quite uh, on the, uh, on the, you know, on the right foot when I, you know, this is a little bit ironic, but um, I, you know, during my PhD already, I wanted to develop a new model organism, a new system to study aging because I wasn't quite satisfied with. Uh, the currently available model organism. So I, I uh, happened to to start studying this extremely short-lived fish that lives just a few months in captivity. And this fish happens to live in, um, in very remote areas in, uh, in Africa, Mozambique and Zimbabwe. So the first thing I had to to, to face was, you know, uh, getting access to this organism. So already during my PhD, I. Um, I had an expedition in Mozambique and I tried to get into Zimbabwe to study this fish. And so we got wild populations. So we were really doing field work in the savanna. And that was, you know, importing fish and uh, uh, setting up the cohorts in the laboratory, getting the husbandry right. You know, it's, it's a continuous, of course, um, you know, one, um, um, I wouldn't say obstacle after the next, but um, um, uh, it's one problem after the other that you need to solve in order for your for your vision or your your intuition to be to be tested. Even so, um, I think setting up a new model organism has probably been the most um, challenging, but at the same time also fulfilling uh, part of uh, of my work so far. Because uh, once you you get the protocol right, or you sequence the genome, or you map the gene you're interested in, or you uh, you set something new in a you get transgenesis working, for instance, is in a, in a non-classical model organism, that's all the efforts are, are definitely worth it. So uh, a lot of obstacles, but, you know, uh, as scientists, we face every day uh, unknowns. And um, uh, so I think we, yeah, that's what we're here for. Yeah. So I guess, you know, whoever does science has to be ready to, to, to face the, you know, uncertainty. Is this the infamous killer fish which you're studying? Excuse me? What is the fish called which you're studying? 
So this is uh, the turquoise killifish. It's called Notobranchus birdseri. Yeah, so this is a model that I started setting up as a new system during my PhD. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I just, um, I think the sound quality is a little bit low. So I noticed yeah. that when you move back, it's, this actually sounds louder. So yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. Perfect. Okay, now, and what in your opinion are the best things about such research? Is it maybe personal achievements, group work, or the excitement of learning something new? Are you asking me specifically about research in aging or are you asking me about your research, research in general? Your research. Well, I, of course I can speak better about my own research, but what I like the most about it is that um, um, I, I think that, you know, uh, doing research is a social enterprise. So uh, you can't quite rely exclusively on yourself. So you have to, um, you need others and others need you and you need like a complementarity of skills to, for things to, uh, to work. And um, um, I think the most exciting part is definitely, uh, you know, complementing each other's skills to, 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 to achieve, achieve novel, novel findings. So your question is, sorry, is, is about what it's most exciting about? Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Can you reformulate the question again? Uh, once sure. So the best things about doing your research. Sorry. Right. So, mm -hmm. well, there are several things, you know, of course, there is the thrill of the discovery. Sometimes you have this kind of like, um, uh, you know, I don't know, dopamine discharge. Okay. When you, you, you think you have you found something new and a lot of times you have the illusion that you've found something new and... Uh, then maybe you're missing a control. So especially as an inexperienced scientist, you, you are oftentimes prone to think that you have something that nobody else has seen before. Sometimes it's true, right? But I have to say most of the time, either someone, someone has already seen it, which is still fine, you know? We can rediscover a thing and it's still very exciting to me and very fulfilling. Or it could be that it's not quite as we think it is, right? So, so I, you, you kind of like, you're excited, but then you also learn to be a little bit more, more cautious about, uh, you know, you have to hold your horse, you know, uh, your horses a little bit. But it's, it's still a lot of excitement in this, this you know, novelty finding kind of mm -hmm. effort. Uh, I also find a lot of excitement in, you know, being part of this broader family of scientists, right? So um, in a way, uh, we have our own language. We are kind of like a tribe our own and the uh, biology of aging is a tribe within a tribe right so what i mean by that is that we have our own jargon we have which sometimes is very hard for others to understand um we use terms in ways that other people don't use even the word aging or senescence are very loaded term that different people use in different ways and uh, so very very risky sometimes but the excitement is in the, um you know sharing together a, a field, a sense of community. You organize this meeting sometimes or you take part in meetings like this ARDD and you find colleagues and friends and you are updated about you know, the latest and greatest from them and you're very proud of your own students, for instance, as I get older as a, as a mentor, as a PI, some of my former postdocs and PhD students that moved on in their career and I see them succeeding and, you know, um, Holding as scientists and maturing and really flourishing and that's really gives me a lot of pride and joy and uh, um, and so this is definitely something that I am very excited about and uh, that you know really pushes me forward uh, having the younger generations being curious about about this type of research is also something that excites me and that's why I actually wanted to 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 answer to this call from from your guys side I think this is very important. And um, and of course, you know there are all these you know bigger picture prospects of uh, having an impact, not just on the basic science, the knowledge, you know, finding uh, something new and fundamental that wasn't quite found before. And there is also some hedonism in that, in, uh, in, in being the pioneer, the first one to, to find something, someone else. But it's also like a, a sense of you know maybe this is going to turn out to be useful to to alleviate suffering and to to move uh, uh, to move the society forward, um, you know. Now, in particular with this pandemic, we see how important it is to uh, take into very very careful account uh, age uh, age class as a factor in responses to vaccination and to susceptibility to 
to uh, you know whatever the consequences of infection by mm-hmm. COVID nineteen are. So so you know if we can make progress to 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 better our condition, that actually also definitely something that. Uh, pushes us forward and then of course you know scientists are human beings and so there is a lot of like agonism to competition to some extent so there is also this kind of like the anthropology of the scientists that you know uh, you know there is there is this interesting group dynamic where uh, you want to be good you want to be seen and, and respected and 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 um, so there are also all these this kind of like social dynamics that sometimes lead to something not too, too, too nice, but to some extent also, some people are motivated to do well by these dynamics. So, so sometimes mm-hmm. they are also positive, yeah. And what skill set was necessary for you to have to become the researcher you are today? So in other, in other words, what habits were necessary for you and helped you bring you to this position today? Uh, I'm not entirely sure. So I can, I can provide you like, you know, I think, I think for sure luck uh, is, is a big factor, but uh, that's not a skill, right? So it's an accident. Well, I mean, um, in terms of skill, so what I may have contributed, I can try to reverse engineer my 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 career so far, but I think there is a lot of stochasticity in it, right? So I was lucky enough to to encounter the right people and to have the right condition in the first place, you know, supporting parents, etc. So I think that plays, you know, that's a condition without which um, I think it's almost impossible to have the, in a way, the luxury to, to become a, a researcher, like an investigator. So for my perspective, well, you have to be curious. Um, uh, you need to have this kind of like almost obsessive curiosity for, for the novelty or, um, you know, you, you have not to believe into everything you see. I think a little bit of skepticism and curiosity and even a little bit of boldness, right? So you need to also have this feeling of, not I think I know better, but um, I'm not sure I'm convinced by this explanation. There may be alternative explanations, right? So, and I think that could, in a way, uh, play some role. So I think you'll probably, probably like, like I mentioned before, there may be something into, you know, this kind of problem-solving attitude, like trying to crack, code, you know, crack uh, puzzles and stuff like that. I think that really helps. Uh, I think some sort of like, uh, uh, I'm not afraid of, math and statistics i think that really helps because i think now more and more biology is becoming data heavy and uh, we need to be data savvy and um, and not be afraid of computers and programming and uh, so i think that is something i'm very willing to embrace and uh, i kept on studying in that respect so i think this is uh, also important and um um I have also not suffered too much the influence of people have tried to, so, you know, as I was developing a new model system, a lot of people have told me, I think this is a terrible idea. This is too risky. Um, I don't think this is going to ever work. And uh, you don't have a genome for this organism. You don't have transgenesis. Well, every time people were telling me that, I was trying to not prove them wrong, but I, I sort of like also had this gut feeling that there was a way to get to, to the end of it. So you, you need to have some sort of like, that boldness, I guess, that, that mm-hmm. helps. And also communication skills are important. So, you know, I think the end point of doing science is also communicating your results. A lot of times we, our research is funded by, by public service. So it's important to the public, for the public to know things and you need to communicate to the public and to your colleagues what you're doing. So having some sort of like social out, um, um, you know, out, you know, channel, um, mm-hmm. it's, it's important to be able to, to be in touch to the world and, and, and communicate and have you know a positive relationship with, with your colleagues. Yeah. I think this is important. And generally, I tend not to be too abrasive with, with others as much as I can. Mm-hmm. Thank you for sharing this. And now I'll post some questions on um, many of today's teenagers' interests. So we're keen on hearing your opinion on these things as you're an expert in longevity. So you've been actively researching the microbiome as far as I know, and um, as a major um, player in aging mechanisms. So how would you say we can improve our microbiome? Since as far as I understand, the better and the healthier the microbiome, and the more diverse it is, the longer you live. But please correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> right. So we don't know much actually how to, to modulate it uh, in a beneficial way. Um, we don't understand it. But I mean, I guess, you know, one uh, possibility is uh, 
well to limit the use of antibiotics probably you know so there, there are some uh, some um, you know there's a tendency by some physicians to prescribe way too many antibiotics when it's not necessary this could be one thing um so um I actually, it's a, it's a very tough question. So I think that uh, uh, maintaining also like a social, um, you know, a thick social network is important because of course the organisms that share most of our species specific microbes are our conspecifics, other humans. So it's important to, to be part of a, of a community and probably that keeps our microbiota, our intestinal microbiota particularly rich. Right, so I think this pandemic might have been actually pretty tough on uh, on our microbiome. Probably, I'm not sure whether we can monitor diversity of microbes over the past few years in, um, in a longitudinal fashion. But I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a uh, a dip in in individual diversity. I mean, it may not be due to the fact that we have fewer interactions, but we are, you know, we are we have been isolated for a long time, so probably. We should get out there and, and and share more the environment with others as soon as it's safe doing it. Um, uh, of course, the microbiome also depends on on our feeding habits, our um, you know prescription drugs. Uh, that sometimes we can't avoid by taking them, but um, having diverse diets, probably you know like a vegetable based diet, I think it's probably has been shown to be one of the one of the best insurance insurances for our microbiome to be to be sufficiently rich, you know, fiber rich diets. Uh, that's really uh, what fosters our microbial health. Um, and um, right, I think also I'm not entirely sure about how traveling is actually, you know, um, traveling of how much that would be very good for you. I think there are other people that that would be more entitled to. To, to speak for that, and I'm having up, for example, at yeah, the Weizmann Institute. Uh, I mean, I work specifically on, on fish, right? I, I've been working on the microbiome of a model organism, and what I can tell you is that transplanting microbes from young, healthy individuals that have a very rich microbiota to older individuals that have a more, you know, poorer microbiome has benefited dramatically the recipient organisms and even extending their, their lifespan, boosting their immune health. Um, whether this works also in mammals and in humans, we don't know. So I can't quite uh, give you a, a prescription in that respect. Um, but also what we suspect is happening is that the microbiome is not just a function of, um, of our um, feeding habits or uh, you know, the drugs that we, we, we take, etc. But it's also a function that you know, the health of our microbiome is also a function of our immune health. In other words, um, our health status promotes in and of itself our microbial diversity. So it's a very mutual interaction in a circular manner. Um, so while the, a rich microbiome stimulates the immune system, also like a healthy immune system, makes sure that our, our you know, nutrients, uh, the nutrients that we absorb during, during you know, uh, feeding are converted into substrate that foster uh, microbial diversity per se. Um, Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, I think we don't quite know yet how to foster microbial health. One uh, idea would be probably in the future to uh, keep track of your own microbiome uh, in times of health and in times of uh, disease. And maybe, maybe there will be ways to store it in a, in a meaningful way and to resource to your own microbiome because that's that's your best insurance probably to your own uh, better health. And so probably there will be plans in the future to uh, restore your own personal microbiome by re-ingesting uh, it or acquiring it by other, by other means. Probably this would be a safe way to do it. But sometimes there is incompatibility between individual microbiome. There are actually ways in which microbiota are incompatible between individuals. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that social connections can actually influence your microbiome. How does this work? Yeah. So, for instance, uh, uh, in a in a household, in a in a family uh, house, uh, there is even though the spouse and the you know the spouses are not sharing you know a lot of the genetics with one another, they still share much more the microbiome than individuals living in different households. Like even you know 
two twin brothers that live in different environments, well, their spouses will share more with the twin brother than the twin brother between themselves. So uh, living in separate households. And even we share our micro pets, for instance, our own pets, dogs and cats, they actually will carry, they will bring in microbes that will probably enrich ourselves also with, uh, with microbes. So, so this is... Uh, uh, this is actually very interesting to think about how um, dogs and cats that we like so much to watch and on the social media, et cetera, and to have, they actually may be directly influencing our microbiota, bringing in and uh, microbes from, from outside. So this could also have like a direct impact on our immune health and, uh, uh, you know, cognitive health, et cetera. So, you know, maybe also for the retirement homes, um, one could think about experimenting with the pet uh, therapy, mm -hmm. where you bring in pets or uh, even kids from uh, from uh, from preschools. So what uh, what I'm referring to specifically is that well, this is based also on the studies that we do. So what we have observed is that while older individuals are prone to acquire microbiome from younger individuals and they benefit from this, mm -hmm. if you try to transfer microbiome from old individuals, in this case fish, no, to young individuals, well, the young individuals will be completely resilient to that. So they will be shielded from the pathogenic microbes that would be present in the older individuals, for example, and they will maintain their own age match microbi microbial health. So probably having contacts between uh, elderly individuals and, and younger uh, individuals, uh, even for humans, could leading to benefits, direct benefits to the elderly. Although this is my, you know, hypothesis, but there are, as far as I know, no studies that can prove that. But it would be fun to try this. Probably. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. <laughs> and this is another question connected to like diet and microbiome. So would you say that your diet strongly affects your lifespan from your very childhood? So for example, as a child, I ate a lot of sweets rather than vegetables. Could this strongly affect my lifespan, for example? Yeah, so there are all these imprinting effects, and this is metabolic. I mean, so, yeah, so of course there are metabolic imprinting, so there are ways in which uh, your, uh, also, also your, um, your brain uh, expects certain types of um, um, nutrients. At a given point, you can get addicted to a certain type of um, composition, uh, in nutritional composition, and that may, on the long run, uh, create a sort of like a... Um, an expectation that it's hard to to, to rewire uh, even neurologically, you know, neurobiologically. When it comes to the microbiome, whether we are set on a particular trajectory since early on, well, it is very well understood now that uh, the early stages of life are very very important to set uh, like a um, microbiome on the right track. Right, so um, upon birth, that is the first wave of colonization of, uh, of the gastrointestinal tract by, if it's a natural birth from the uh, vaginal microbiome of the mother, and then there are this milk, uh, if you have breastfeeding, uh, breastfed um, babies, that is also helping set and, and, and um, a particular type of microbial community, right, this bifidobacteria. Uh, and uh, if you think about it, it's, it's quite amazing that uh, the human um, milk has a particular type of sugars, this uh, uh, milk, human milk oligosaccharide, I think they're called, that are undigestible to the baby. So the baby cannot turn these sugars into fuel for its own benefit. But these sugars are only digestible to specific type of microbes. So basically these sugars that are present in the maternal milk are there to foster the colonization of the gastrointestinal tract by specific types of bacteria. Mm -hmm. So this is just to speak to how well, you know, um, carved into, into our genes it is the uh, setting, the microbiome on the, on the right track already since the very beginning. And uh, uh, now those communities of microbes will uh, help shape the immune system in specific ways. And, uh, and several autoimmune diseases that happen, on, happen uh, later on in life have been uh, associated with uh, uh, 
uh, early exposures to, to, to different types of microbial communities and to lack thereof also, right? So if you have uh, infants that have been, uh, you know, that are born with cesarean section or they have not been breastfed, I think that there, there is now mounting evidence, you know, increasing evidence that this poses them to a higher risk for, for certain type of autoimmune, autoimmune diseases compared to those who are instead born of natural birth and they are fed uh, maternal milk. Yeah, so, so uh, whether the microbiome per se uh, persists over time, uh, or whether it, uh, its effects early on in life are indirect or later effect by uh, virtue of the fact that those microbes will impact the development of the immune system. Therefore, later on, you will have impact on metabolism, the physiology of the, of the individual. That's not entirely clear yet, but for sure, there are critical periods in, uh, in our life where we are expected to uh, be populated uh, by by a rich microbial community of specific types of microbes. Yeah. Um, so just a personal interest, um, introducing a new molecule to a person's microbiome, would that sort of make the person foster more microbiome um, bacteria, which can then break down this molecule? Or is this only in the child sort of stage of life? Are you asking whether by introducing molecules, then microbes will break them down and... Um, well, I can rephrase the question. Um, so you said, you mentioned that you could introduce oligosaccharides to newborns mm -hmm. and they start fostering bacteria, which then breaks down this saccharide. So right. is it possible to do that with a lot of molecules or only a few specific ones, which evolution has predisposed us to? Oh yeah, I mean, I. I think I think it's possible to to uh, to foster uh, different types of different members of the of the microbiome community. So, what happens is that our microbiome is extremely rich. So you have um, you have really like a biodiversity in in the gut that it's it's unmatched on Earth. So the the in terms of uh, of diversity, really, like so the the you have a lot of different types of bacteria, right? And archaea, very importantly, and fungi, and other organisms. Um, uh, yeah, and viruses, phages. And um, what specific molecules can do is to promote, selectively promote the growth uh, or inhibit the growth of specific members of this very rich consortium. So you basically, you can think of it as, as a very diverse, you know, as a as a enormous uh, range of opportunities there, and then you can pick which ones you can you can um, foster more, right? And uh, um, so you can every time uh, let some, you know, win locally their their game. The other won't be gone but they will be suppressed, right? And we think that this is exactly what the immune system is constantly doing, right? So the immune system, we think it's when you're healthy, is mounting pro-inflammatory responses. So it's kind of attacking and shutting down the pathogens or the potentially pathogenic bacteria, or microbes. And instead, also, there is a whole other uh, function of the immune system, which is that of fostering the commensals, the good ones, right? So a lot of things, a lot of times we think of the immune system as this defense mechanism, this wonderful, very sophisticated um, system that uh, is oftentimes described with, uh, with the language of warfare, right? Immune defense, immune attack, immune destruction, or you know, uh, demolition, etc. But there is also a, a immune system of peace, of uh, of um, fostering, of of uh, encouraging certain microbes to 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 thrive. And 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 since we have a lot of commensals uh, at any time, a lot more than pathogens. Uh, then we think that there is a lot of large part of the immune system where we don't understand, which is the immune system that promotes the uh, the commensals, right? And um, so this is exactly what the immune system generally does. But then certain nutrients, certain oligosaccharides, for instance, can also 
do the same thing. They can promote certain certain members of the microbiome. So yes, we can artificially um, promote some members of the microbiome potentially. Mm -hmm. And is also genetics a really strong player in longevity? And do you think it's, is it possible to have a long lifespan even if you don't have a genetic predisposition to one? Well, yes, I mean, I think the modern medicine is showing that it's possible, right? So I think having so many individuals individuals nowadays living to their 70s and 80s is quite unprecedented in, uh, in our culture, in our, in our species history. So I think that genetically we are no different from what we were before. And uh, I mean, I, I underwent, for example, appendectomy when I, appendectomy when I was eight year old, and probably I would have not survived in uh, in another society without the healthcare system. And uh, um, I think that we are, you know, the testament to the success of medicine. So uh, even if we don't have necessarily uh, great genes, we can still make it. So uh, how does that relate to the microbiome? Um, well, I think that, uh, yeah, I think we're keeping up the pace with, uh, I mean, think about now with uh, with the, this vaccine campaign, right? So uh, even if we are even necessarily not even genetically uh, weaker, but uh, uh, even uh, older individuals now can 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 respond to vaccine because thanks to the adjuvants, thanks to uh, to developing new types of vaccine. And so, of course, even though the genetics may be penalizing us, we are able to to overcome, um, you know, the environmental challenges. Yeah, if that's your question, right? Yeah. I don't know if I answered, but yeah. Yes, you did. And mm -hmm. are there any specific longevity genes which you have discovered in the killer fish? And could they be implanted into humans? Could they be important to humans? Well, right, so our work in the genomics of, of, of killer fish has been uh, really fun because and you're right. So a lot of a lot of researchers focus on, on individual genes, right? So you have your pet gene, and you're very attached to your uh, I don't know, Fox four or Fox three or Tor or this pathway or MPK, and then um, a lot of the world of the, of the, of the biology makes sense uh, at the light of that individual wonderful gene. But biology is very integrated, and a lot of genes talk to one another. And so what we, have, what, we, what we have found, and one of the most exciting findings that uh, we had in the, in the lab is, comes from the following question, and I will go back to your question about the genes. Uh, it comes from the question of why evolutionarily these fish are so short -lived? Why on earth they, so what, what happened to them? What happened to their genome to make them short -lived? What genes were, went wrong and when? And so what we found is that uh, it's these fish are not short-lived because one, two genes um, uh, became mutated and uh, and accumulated the so-called deleterious version of the gene, right? Deleterious allele, meaning uh, detrimental, um, um, har harmful gene, uh, um, gene variants. But actually, the vast majority of the genome of the short-lived fish uh, is mutated in a sort of like quite bad way. And so I think these this, this organisms specifically are sort of like a testament to how polygenic um, uh, biology of aging is. Polygenic means simply that it's a multi-gene uh, phenomenon. It means that there is the contribution of a myriad of um, not just genes, but within a given gene, you have multiple uh, bad variants that could accumulate in different individuals of the population. And in this fish, for specific um, uh, circumstances, that I don't know if you want to hear necessarily, uh, but for specific circumstances, these particular organisms accumulated a vast mutation load, we call it. So a large amount of, of negative mutations in many, many, many different genes, including the classical genes that are known to be involved in the aging process. In other words, this fish is a natural experiment in what we say mutagenesis. So as accumulated, it's like yeah, as if it actually survived an atomic uh, war, right? And, and, and accumulated all those mutations, like mutations in their germline. And they didn't get rid of those mutations for specific ecological and evolutionary reasons. But uh, 
So what we see instead of like the one gene or two genes, we see we actually have uh, a plethora of genes. One such genes, for example, I can list you that accumulated several deleterious gene variants that affect, we know for sure, mutation rate, which is a very bad thing, that leads to very high mutation rate in the killifish, in the short killifish, is a gene called polymerase gamma. It's a gene that is important for mitochondrial function. So for the replication of mitochondria, mitochondria are these little organelles that uh, convert energy in, um, in, uh, in eukaryotic cells. And so this particular gene has accumulated several bad, bar bad variants in our killifish. And so, uh, and it's contributing to very high mutation rate. Uh, and but I can give you, you know, thousands of examples of other genes that are equally badly uh, mutated in our killifish. So um, I think that's also as a community, we have to sort of overcome the, the concept that one, two genes, fixing one, two genes may be the way to overcome the aging process. I think it's more complex than that. Mm -hmm. And the mutagens that you discovered, are they also common for humans or are they only for the killifish? No, they're also common for humans, as a matter of fact. It's a very good question, this one. So the mutagen, as you say, actually, the factor that led to this very high increase in mutation rate is not an external thing. It's actually a dem it's demography. So it's actually bottlenecks. So in other words, these populations of killifish underwent several consecutive population bottlenecks. These are basically large populations of individuals, very diverse individuals that underwent like a bottleneck, which means very few survived. And then the population expanded. But with the population expanding numerically, you don't have diversification of the gene pool again. And then the population collapses again numerically and then expands and collapses and expands. And this leads to, uh, you know, a sampling error, which means that you, you actually are subsampling the diver genetic diversity and eventually you're homogenizing your gene pool. So you have fewer and fewer um, gene variants. And even the bad gene variants will become highly frequent in the population. So there is no way for selection to overcome this continuous bottlenecks that the killifish underwent over, over time. And this particular demographic disaster that happened to killifish happened because they live in a very particular environment where the water is available intermittently and, and they undergo cycles of um, drought and rehydration. But this, is, this has to do with the ecology of the fish. In humans, we underwent also recently a, several bottlenecks. So we had the out of Africa and we had several bottlenecks in different human populations. And we also have accumulated a lot of deleterious gene variants, some of which are also associated with, um, with age-related diseases. Yeah, so we think that very similar mechanisms are in play in humans and in killifish. And for instance, other organisms like flies or yeast or mice that also age, we think that they age in a completely different way from, uh, from humans and killifish because they didn't undergo this dramatic bottleneck as we did. And so they age for slightly different reasons. And the genetics, the complexity of, uh, of the genetics of aging in those organisms is, uh, is different from, from us. Yeah. Mm. And are there any ethical concerns with your research, for example, using killer fish? Or, and if there are, what problems have they caused? Uh, well, I mean, of course, one always can uh, question whether uh, animal research is justifiable, whether animal experimentation is justifiable. And one could question whether it's worth it to, to, to raise animals in a laboratory to ask these mundane questions of uh, longevity and aging. Um, I think it's a legitimate question. I think that I like to believe that the, the outcome of our researches um, uh, surpass the, um, the costs of our research in terms of like animal suffering. By the way, we, you know, as, I, as, I, as I'm explaining to you, we don't challenge a fish to live short, or if anything, we try to have them live longer. So if anything, our uh, naturally, you know, our, our, our short-lived, naturally short-lived killifish, if our experiment work, live longer than, than, than they would otherwise, like when we transfer them microbes. Um, but uh, I weigh uh, on, the, on, the, on the balance whether, 
it's oftentimes whether it's more ethically justifiable to perform animal research or to farm animals. And in terms of volume of um, animals that are uh, killed for animal farming, I think that any, uh, research on animals is just like, like a very, very tiny Blimey. fraction. So, so if, we, if we were to compare this, I think that if one thing has to go, should be animal farming, surely not uh, 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 experimentation on animals. So this is my, my, uh, my take on the, on the, on the problem. Uh, uh, um, on this very problem. Uh, our research on killifish specifically also is raising uh, some awareness regarding conservation in killifish. We have a recent, recent work that, where we, we explore the genetics and the genomics of the killifish on the Seychelles Islands. This paper just came out and we discovered that the populations of this fish uh, is collapsed and it's the population size, like I just said now, the, the demography is so uh, severely uh, impoverished the, the, the gene pool that this species is, is risking extinction. So, so measures to protect this species should be put in place to, uh, to avoid extinction. And so I think if I, I like to believe also that our researchers you know, could be helping policies one of our collaborators on this work on the Seychelles killifish is a conservation biologist, and she's specifically interested in uh, um, piping this news and this this information and this reported case uh, into uh, and, and 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 translate it into into actions that could protect conservation. But also, you know, eventually to to answer the more ethical broader point, I think that uh, the ultimate goal is to um, uh, shed light on the mechanisms that lead to organisms to age, and in particular humans. And so um, I think that ultimately, uh, it's a few more justifiable to do research uh, to, to ameliorate our condition than, than, for example, animal farming. This, mm -hmm. is, is, my, this is my perspective. And what do you think is the near future of longevity in terms of direction of research? Yeah, that's a very good question. I wonder. Um, so I, I feel that there are these two. Well, I, I can I can I can uh, witness that there are different currents, right? So there is uh, in the aging research. I mean, of course, there are the hot topics. You know, there is senescence. Uh, who focuses on different strategies to how to you know the, the hallmarks of aging, and everybody's trying to to fix. Marks. Um, then of course there is there are those who believe that there is no way that you can reprogram aging that all you can do at best is to slow it down and delay it, postpone it, etc. But there are also there is like, there is the so called the party or the church of those who believe that uh, it's possible to completely reprogram organisms and rejuvenation is achievable. Uh, and we can we can live forever. So what the what the future will will, will probably bring is um, well, I think there is a lot of pharmacology that needs to be done in the in the in the next few years. I think we need to understand deeply how the immune system plays uh, at the physiological level to um, to do its job because you know. A lot of the things that we do we want to do as biologists of aging are already done by the immune system. The immune system repairs organisms, contributes to regeneration of, uh, of tissues and organs. The immune system fights pathogens. So the immune system is just what we should really be, I think, looking at uh, um, to, to, um, you know, to fix and to, to, to repurpose uh, um, organisms as we get older. So I think immune health is going to be a big target. This is my, my not just my uh, take on this. Uh, a lot of biologists uh, who study biology of aging come from cellular biology and biochemistry. And so that is uh, oftentimes like a cell-centric, uh, I mean, it's not a bad thing, right? But there is oftentimes a cell-centric view of, um, of biology of aging as if an organism is a cell, like you know, there are some single cell organisms, but I think that we have to be more a little bit more aware of physiology. So you know, uh, organ organ interaction, and I think that biology of aging classically um, has been a little bit uh, um, uh, has not paid too much attention to, to 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 physiology. I think it, you know, there is there is a, a refocus in the, in the 
last two years. But I think that um, for contingent reasons, it hasn't been too much. Like, so, so I hope that, you know, that is also like a redefinition that is this uh, gero science, which, you know, promises to, to, to bring together biology of aging and uh, gerontology um, with interventions, anti-aging interventions. So I think that, um, yeah, putting the, the organism with its own physiology and also I, I hope I will contribute and I'm contributing to I hope it's this kind of like species species and in the, uh, cross species interaction right so this host microbiome interactions are very key to, 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 to biology of aging and so our perspective our angle is very much into exploring how we can uh, we can tweak uh, homeostasis and aging by looking at these interactions between between organisms, so hosts and microbes. I think also there, there would be, I can guarantee there would be a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, progress. Um, um, yeah, so it's, it's a field in evolution. And, um, but, uh, you know, I think it's very hard to make, uh, you know, a strong prediction at this point. Uh, I, I, I know what's going on in terms of like the main lines of research, but, um, very hard for me to know where the field will be in five years time. And my very last question for today is, what would you recommend to today's teenagers if they want to dive into the field of longevity? Right, so, uh, well, first of all, don't be afraid of reaching out to, to, to the scientists. I mean, now everybody is accessible, so you can access anybody uh, on an email, um, via, via emails or, so I think you there are platforms now to, to directly ask questions to, to scientists. You can intern. I mean, the odds are that most of the places you live, you know, you have someone who's working on aging not too far from you. So you can intern. You can you always you know just try to see how the uh, the, the atmosphere is in within a lab. And uh, um, so um, I oftentimes welcome students joining our journal class or lab meeting. So I think that's, that's always good. Stimulating also helps us um, speak more clearly. So I think that uh, you guys, should, you know, the students should know that, right? So that it's possible to, to access uh, uh, scientists right away. And, you know, um, think of, you know, scientists working on biology of aging as not necessarily uh, inaccessible and old themselves, but uh, someone accessible. So, um, you know, um, just go out there uh, and don't be too afraid to ask questions. There are no stupid questions. So, um, and um, yeah, I think that um, um, having, having first-hand experience of, um, of what it means to, to, to research on aging, I think would be, the, would be the best suggestion I have. So try to enter in labs if you can. Here in Germany, there are these practical programs. So these are programs where uh, students can, can do rotations in, uh, in research lab. And oftentimes I have students and I'm very happy to have them. I had some just a heads up to anybody watching this uh, conference, you can always speak to the people on the RDD conference and ask them about anything that you want to know and contact them. So, Absolutely. <laughs> thank you very much, Dr. Valenzano. This was um, all of my questions and it was, it was great speaking to you today. The information we heard is definitely really, really valuable. So we're all really grateful for that. And we're looking forward to hearing more from you on the RDD conference in September. Thank you. Bye. Andrea, it's been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye.